And so, yeah, here we go. I have a part. Today we're going to be doing some milling inside of Rhino. Uh, I am using version 7, but pretty much everything we're going to be doing could also work in uh, Rhino 6. Uh, really no difference at all um, that I've noticed for, for the things I'm doing. I, there's no difference. And for Bobcam, it's the exact same Bobcam. So essentially... Get your part opened into Rhino. Um, I didn't move it. The only thing I've done to this part so far is uh, just scale it properly. Uh, it originally was opening up in millimeters. So it was originally opening up as like 190 something inches. It was ginormous. But as soon as I switched to inches, it asked if it will uh, if I wanted it to scale. And I scaled it back down. So what we're going to start with is I want to go up to Bobcam here. And inside of Bobcam, I'm just going to go to the help right here. Now, this is something I pull up, and hopefully it pulls up. There it is. Now, this is something I open up, and it's in every version of Bobcat or every kind of build of the system, uh, whether it's the standalone version, Bobcad Cam, or the Bobcam plugin for Rhino or SolidWorks. Whenever you launch the help system, what you need to know is that it always opens to the exact same page. And so when it opens, it's always going to go to this introduction tab for us. Now, if you want, you could go over on the left and see what's new. And that'll go through kind of everything that's new in the system for, um, for Bobcam. But from this introduction page, if we go down to right here where it says using cam, we can click on that. And we're just going to give it a second to load up. And looks like more people are joining in. Perfect. When this shows up, so after you click on using cam, it loads the cam overview page. And right here, we're going to go to the read me first cam quick guide. Now, what this is, is a set of just generic steps for machining inside of, well, Rhino or, or using Bobcam, essentially. So... First thing I did in Rhino was I just typed the word Bobcam in the command line. And then this is going to show Bobcam if it's all installed. So that's what I did to open the Bobcam portion of it up. Now, in that help system, let me find that page again. The first thing we need to do is start a new cam job. Now, I want to point out that these steps aren't really specific to mill. Uh, if you read it right up here, you'll see both mill and lathe. Uh, but it's really just the generic steps for every kind of machining. Because if you're doing mill turn or wire EDM or any of that stuff, the steps are pretty much the same. We always have to start right here at step number one. We have to tell it what kind of job we're doing, whether it's a milling job, a turning job, a mill turn job, what have you. And so that's where we're going to start. Now, this is a step that a lot of people miss because... They forget about it, or they always forget this first step of how you get started. What, what do I need to do? And so I'm going to go down to Bobcam. Right here is where it says Cam Defaults. And I just want to go point out, when you click on these blue links, they give you some information about whatever it was you just clicked on. So to start a new Cam job, we actually have three different ways of doing it. We could go into the Cam tree, right-click on Cam Defaults, and say new job. We also have our Bobcam menu. Uh, do I have it showing? Where is it? Oh, there it is right, right in front of me. Here's the Bobcam sub menu. And you'll see right here is another way to start a new job. And then the final way that it mentions is right here, this little guy, this little button at the top of the cam tree. You won't see that button unless you're on the cam tree, but that's another way to start a new job. So I'm just going to right click on cam defaults and say new job. From here, we would tell it what type of job we're running. Is it a milling job, turning job, mill turn job, or wire EDM job? And again, the steps that we follow, uh, they're generic enough that any of them will work. So I'm going to go ahead and choose milling. Right down here, we have our machine. Now, you may have a different default machine. One, I'm using a fresh install of Rhino and Bobcam for this because I just got a new hard drive, so I had... I uh, had to reinstall everything just last week. And so I have a fresh install of Bobcam. So I haven't actually set any of this stuff up. But if you did, 
uh, go online and download a post processor or, uh, or a machine, or you worked with tech support or the posting department and you got a new machine, either it's going to show up here by default, or you'll have to click in this list and set it. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and hit OK right quick. Another way of setting everything up is before you ever start the job, go put all these things in place so or, or get all your defaults set up. And you can get to your defaults by right clicking right here on cam defaults. And then you go down to your current settings. So inside of current settings, this is where I could pick the machine that I want to show up every time I choose a milling job. All right. You could also pick a lathe that you want to show up every time you pick a lathe job or a wire EDM or what have you. To set it as the default, you make sure the machine you want is listed right here. You know, it's in the make. And then you say save as a default. That will now be my default machine. You can change it to whatever you want. Down below that, we're going to enter in the machine parameters, uh, the number of tools, the rapid feed rate, maximum spindle speed, and the maximum cutting feed rate. And then right here, we have customized coolant options. So this gives you more coolant options. If you have a through the spindle coolant system, uh, in the past, we couldn't run those because it would just output, you know, flood, mist, air, or oil, but we can do through the spindle coolant. Your post may need to be updated for that uh, to work properly and be added in, but pretty simple. All you got to do is find out what the commands are and send that info over to the posting department. They'll be able to add it into your, uh, into your post processor so you can use them. So I'm not going to do any custom coolant. Over here on the left, we then have our machine definition. This is just kind of how the machine is virtually built and not really anything we need to change right now. I don't recommend going in here and changing any of this stuff, but it is also, if you're just going to use the BC3X mill with your post processor, so you're going to use the BC3X mill, but you want to use a you know just a Fanuc post or something, uh, that's totally fine and you can do that. Just be aware that the default BC3X mill here has its size. It's It's got a size. So the Y is minus 12 to 12. So it's a 24 inch travel for Y. X is tw minus 28 to 28. So 56. And then Z goes from, whoops, got to click on the actual Z. Z goes from zero. It goes up to 24 inches. So I got a 24 inch Z. So you do want to make sure that you enter in your machine information. And that's this is just nice because the simulation will then warn us if we're going outside of those ranges at all. The other thing to take note of is what, where they're located. Now, your machine home could be the back left corner of the table or wherever the machine home is. But what we're doing when we set the distances for this machine is we're setting up from the middle of the table how many inches in in negative y can I go from there? How many inches in positive y? So basically, you're just going to take your total di or your, your total diameter, your total width of y, and divide it by two. Half of it's going to be a negative, the other half is going to be a positive, and the two numbers added together should equal the size of your table. All right. Over here for posting, this is where we select the default post processor to be used with this specific machine. So like I was saying a second ago, if you have a Fanuc post, or even you can use a Haas post or whatever, if you have a post you want to use, you can go right here and hit select, and then go to your C drive. So I'm just going to go to my C drive. Right here, we have our Bobcad cam data. And in here, I have my Rhino V2. And so in this folder, we can go to our posts, and then Dependent on what type of machine you're setting up, you got your mill, your lathe, your mill turn, or your wire EDM. And inside of mill, I have all the different mill posts. So I'd pick one and hit OK, and that would become the post that gets chosen every time I pick this machine. So it'll save me from having to set these settings up again in the future. While we're here, we also have our NC file path. I don't recommend changing that. That's just somewhere you, you can just leave that there because you get a chance to save your code when you post it anyway. And then right here, we have our NC file extension. What is the file extension needed for this machine or for this the code that we create? What is needed for the machine? A lot of them will use .nc. Some might use .txt, .tap. 
All you got to do is find that out and set it right here. We can save as any file type in the world. You just have to make sure that the extension is set correctly right here. Uh, other than that, I'm not going to go through any more of the settings in here. I'm just going to go ahead and hit OK. So now that we have our machine set and everything's made right, let me go right here. We've got our new job started. So we know we're doing a milling job. And then right here for step number two, we're going to go and do our stock wizard and machine setup. Now I want to point out if we go directly, so let me delete this real quick. If we go directly from this page where we set up the machine or where we pick the machine and we tell what kind of job we're doing, if we go right into the stock wizard, it's going to ask us to select a workpiece. And a workpiece is a solid model that represents the final finished part. Now we're working in Rhino, so a lot of times you guys will be working with solids, but you could also draw in wireframe. So in a case where your part is just wireframe, you wouldn't have a workpiece. You don't have a solid that represents that final finished part. In this case, we do. So I'm going to go ahead and pick it. And then we're not going to hit OK. If you hit OK, it's going to bring you back to the cam tree where we just have the job listed. We're going to go ahead and hit these arrows that are pointing to the right. And when you hover over it, it'll take us into the stock wizard. So I'm just going to say stock wizard. And there it is. I have some stock around my part. I wasn't planning on really making it any bigger. Uh, six point, let's go, let's go six point, uh, let's go seven five. Uh, we'll go 3.75. And then for Z, it's one and a half inches tall. And what I'm thinking is we'll uh we'll be machining with a thicker piece of material. So I'll go ahead and add, I'll just say a quarter inch on the bottom. Now, right here, we have our offset plus and minus. Right here, we have a gnomon telling us the direction for X, Y, and Z. The direction those arrows are pointing in is the positive direction. So if I was trying to add material to the top of this part, I would go to the offset plus Z and say we add a quarter inch. It's gonna lift that up a quarter of an inch. All right, let me put that back at zero. I do want to add that quarter inch to the bottom of the part, though. So to the bottom of the part, that gets added. And that'll be something we'll say that's what we're holding on to. All right. So from there, I'm going to scroll down, make sure to hit the forward button once again. And then right here, we have our coordinate. Now, by default, it's trying to pick from an existing UCS. We can change that. We can set it wherever we want. In my case, I'm just going to go ahead and say origin. And I'm going to pick, let's go solid jaw back there. So in this case, I should expect to see positive X moves in my code when I'm cutting, negative Y moves, and negative Z moves. All right, we're going off the top of the material. You'll notice I didn't add any material to the top. Even if I'm going to do a facing pass in Bobcat here, I'm not going to add material to the top. It's the way that I do my facing. Uh, may not be the way you do your facing, so just be aware of that. The way I do it is when I run my face, I run my face in Bobcam at zero. So basically my face creates that top surface. And then at the machine, I, I touch off the rough stock and then I jog the head, you know, I jog the spindle down however much I want to take off with my facing. So if I only want to take off 50 thou, I'm going to tag off the top of the part, drop it down 50 thou and then hit go. And it's just going to shave off 50 thou. And the benefit of doing that is I don't have to think about how much has come off prior to the to, to what we're doing. Uh, I don't have to uh, really mess with any settings for you know top of features or top of parts for any tool path that comes after the facing. The facing faces at zero and creates my zero. So yeah, we're not going to add any stock. We're going to go right off that top. Uh, top apart, back left corner there. Uh, I'm going to scroll down. Now, one big thing, and this is more because I have on my license, I have, where is it? Is it popping up? Come on. Might have to wait. On my license, I have the Machine Simulation Pro, which allows me to see the uh, machine inside the simulation if the machine that I pick has models in it. 
So what I have to do is make sure to just lift my part up. Now, work offset one right here. It's this area here. Work offset one is going to be the equivalent of my first work offset, my G54, my E1, whatever my machine decides to call it. So I'm going to leave it there. Normally, with the work offset XYZ, you're not really going to change anything here. Um, normally, like I said, if you guys don't have the Machine Simulation Pro, you really don't even have to worry about this thing because it doesn't affect you. But in my case, all I'm going to do is say in Z, I just want to lift the part up three inches. Uh, what, what's going to end up happening is if I don't change this, my part's going to be inside the table of the machine in the simulation. And I'll just be getting a whole bunch of errors telling me that I'm machining through my table uh, when really I wouldn't be. So that's it. Uh, right here, we have our clearance plane. Remember, this is the only place in the system that you can change the clearance plane. Um, so make sure you got it set properly. One inch is fine for me. And I'm just going to go ahead and hit OK. And so now we have our stock made. We have our work piece set up. We're pretty much ready to go. So I'm just going to go ahead and blank out this stock. And give me two seconds. Let's go. What is it? Settings right here. I want to change my cam. I like all my status, all these blank and unblank values. I like them on the right. So I'm just going to put those on the right. There we go. And there we have it. All right. So now we have our stock. Next, we're going to go back to our cheat sheet. Well, I'll call it a cheat sheet. So number two, finish that. We did our stock wizard and our machine setup. Step number three is select the stock material for the job. But they note right below that that the stock material is used for feeds and speeds calculations. <laughs> Essentially, if you're using uh, Bobcam to calculate the feeds and speeds, then you want to make sure you have the right material. If you're going to manually enter feeds and speeds, maybe you know what your, your spindle RPM and cutting feed rate and plunge feed rate are supposed to be or what you like to run them at, um, then the material that's selected in the job really doesn't matter. Um, the material that's selected in the, in the material section which is right down here so we're just going to expand stock we're only ever using this for feeds and speeds calculations i don't really use bobcad or bobcams feeds and speeds i don't trust them and a lot of times it comes from uh, partially it's be me and me being uh, a bit lazy but a lot of times i don't set my tools up properly either a lot of the tools that are inside of our tool library are high speed steel tools and a lot of times I'm using carbide, but I didn't change any of my tools. So essentially when we're creating tool paths, the system is looking at the material here. So in this case, I have my 1018 carbon steel. I'm gonna edit that. And I'm gonna go to aluminum, we'll say. And what we're doing is we're, let's find 6061 right up here, it's right there. So what you'll see is there's different categories. You have your surface footage per minute for carbide, insert and if we scroll over high speed steel so that's how we're getting our different values and if you accidentally pick a, a carbide tool when you were supposed to grab a high speed steel tool or vice versa we're gonna have the wrong feeds and speeds it happens all the time it's one of the biggest reasons people do run into problems with the feeds and speeds but i also don't use it because i use a program called g wizard and uh g wizard's been fantastic for really figuring everything out it's been uh been great. So if you haven't used G Wizard or haven't looked at G Wizard and you struggle with finding good feeds and speeds for different types of materials sometimes, uh, definitely take a look at G Wizard. It is a fantastic program. Now inside the material, if there's a certain material you cut most often, like in my case, I would say I do more 6061 than I do anything else. So down at the bottom, we could pick the material we want and then say set as a default. And that'll save that so that every time I start a new job and, and get in through the cam tree, it's going to automatically have that 6061 selected. So from here, I'm just going to hit OK. And there we have our material selected. Again, if you're not using Bobcad or using the feeds and speeds that we generate, then it really doesn't have to be selected. But it's such an easy step that you might as well always have the right material. Because at, at the end of this whole thing, we'll be able to generate setup sheets. And if I could generate a setup sheet on that setup sheet, it's going to have the material that I have listed out there. So I do want it to show up properly there. 
So, all right, let's go ahead and pull up our cheat sheet. In one second. There we go. One second, just grab my drink. Okay. All right. So step number four is where we actually start putting in tool paths. And really steps one through three, you know, if I wasn't talking the entire time, those steps are only about a minute, two minutes long. It's really not that difficult. All right. It's those should be pretty quick. And then it's step number four is where we start building some time on top of this. So I'm going to go ahead and go to Rhino. And we're going to start our tool paths. Now, every tool path that you create is going to be created by right clicking right here on machine setup one. And we'll see all the different tool paths we have. We got mill drill hole, mill tap hole, mill counter bore hole, and mill counter bore tap hole. So that's all your drilling options and, and hole making options. And then we have facing, mill two axis, mill three axis, four axis rotary, and multi axis. Those are I, I don't know why they're separated, honestly, because the ones right below that, then you have your threading. So that'll be like not not tapping, but proper thread. Uh, your three axis wireframe, which is an engraving tool path. And then V car, which is one of the tool paths you get with the Bob art, uh, which I don't know how they do it. V carve is a V carve pocket. So essentially what it does is when it cuts a pocket it'll put tapers on the wall. So you can get a flat pocket, flat floor, but it'll put an angle on the walls using a V tool. I'm not gonna run any of that right now. All right, so to get started on this part, we gotta first just think of what do we wanna cut? And we have multiple ways of doing this. Now the part does have tapers on the walls. So I am gonna use a three axis tool path at some point, but do I use that three axis tool path to go in and machine this entire area and just kind of do the whole part? Or do I want it to, you know, do I want to do 2D pockets for this whole area and inside of here and all this, and then come back and just do the outside with three axis? So the benefit of using a full three axis is I just pretty much pick the part and tell it to run and it'll go in and, and make the cuts. The problem we're going to run into is I have no way of really cleaning up afterwards. I, I don't have a G41 or a G42 that I could apply. So if I go and take a measurement of this part when it's all done, and, it, and maybe my tool is worn out, I have no way of adjusting that other than going back and, and making the change. Or you could apply just finish passes to those straight walls. So I think what we'll do is we're going to kind of look at this multiple ways. We'll look at it first with the three axis so we can kind of do it all at once uh, and then we'll go back and add anything specifically that we want to do better or have better control of so i'm just going to right click on machine setup one here and i'm going to go down to the mill three axis all right now when we get into three axis if any of if any of you guys are new to three axis or new to the whole system i guess uh, the first thing it asks us to do is select the geometry the geometry for a 3D model is very simple. So I'm going to say select geometry. I'm going to click on my model. Well, I'll drag a box over it. Drag a box over the whole thing. And that's as difficult as it is. Because I want the system to see everything on this model. A lot of guys get confused when they go through and do this stuff. And they pick you know, that surface. And they say, that's what I want to machine it. And yes, that does work sometimes. But a lot of times that doesn't work and it really depends on kind of how many rapid moves and different types of connections you're making uh, across the part. But basically by picking this floor here, the system's not knowing that there's a tapered wall out here, or that there's really even a wall next to that part. So by picking the entire model, you're telling the system to look at everything. All right. So boundaries. Now, boundaries are important. Boundaries help us contain the toolpath in a specific area. If I didn't want to cut the entire part, I can go ahead and say, select my boundary and say, maybe I just want to go and cut this inside here. So I want to go ahead and pick the edge here. What do I got to do? Control shift. Is that what it is? 
Yeah, right there. So I'll just pick that surface and I could say that is my boundary. And really, I'd want to pick the edge. Endpoint, midpoint, grid snap, ortho, planar. I have something turned off, but I'm not sure which one it is. No, not ortho. What is it? Control shift is what lets me pick edges. No. No. I'm forgetting the button I need. Shift? No. Control? I'll figure it out later. Don't really need it too much because on this one, I'm not actually going to use a boundary. I'm going to leave the boundary off for now because I'm going to let it kind of just do its thing. And if I need to go in and fix something, I will. So for now, top of parts at zero because we set our origin at the top of part, so zero. And so I'll hit OK. And we'll go ahead and hit next. Right here for the feature, we have our clearance plane, which again, that was set up when we made our stock. So there's nothing to change there. We can't change that unless we go back into the stock wizard or really you could just hover over uh, just the machine setup right here, those little arrows that are there and you can change the clearance plane. Rapid plane is set to 200 thousands. So when we make a cut, and this is kind of a bad example of it because it's all pretty continuous cutting. Uh, but let's say we cut this hole and then we go to this hole. We're going to go to 200 thousandths above the top of part. So we're going to wrap it across and then drop down from there. Now, the feed plane that we see is where we start feeding from. So if you've ever had to set up your uh, rapid plane at something because you maybe have to clear a bolt head or whatever in the middle of your part, you set your rapid plane to one or two inches high. The feed plane is where we start feeding in from. So from that one or two inches high, we're then going to wrap it down to a hundred thousandths and then start feeding in from there. Again, top of features at zero, and we'll go ahead and hit next. Now I have the three axis pro. I have, I have everything. So we have the three axis pro here. Uh, there's a few options for how we can rough this thing. I'm going to do kind of a few of them together and uh we'll, we'll just see them all so i'm going to use some three axis standard and some three axis pro and i'm going to start by doing uh we'll say z level rough and then i'm also going to add in my advanced rough which is the pro version or the pro roughing toolpath and it really does make a difference and then for finishing everything it's pretty much walls i mean we really don't have much floor to worry about we do still have some floor, but we don't need it. So I'm gonna add in the, the wall cutting tool path, which is the Z-level finish. When you're trying to finish walls with tapers, Z-level finish is the way to go. So I'll move that over. So we're gonna rough it with the Z-level rough, and then we're also gonna do the advanced rough at the same time. And then we're gonna finish a lot of it with the Z-level finish. And I'm also gonna run the advanced Z level finish along with it. So we can see our standard versions and then our pro versions. And then really to, to get the best finish on this floor here, I'm also gonna add in, it's a three axis pro tool path, but it is fantastic. It's called Flatlands. So I'm just gonna bring that in and that's gonna give us a nice flat floor right there. We also have things like the advanced planer or the regular planer, but they really don't benefit us too much with this part. I, I don't see the point in using them on this part. So that'll be the five paths we run. We got our two different rough passes so we can see which one we like more. Or for those of you that don't have the three axis pro, you can see what that advanced rough is going to do. And then we have our two wall finishers. So the Z level finish and the advanced Z level finish. And then we're using the flatlands just to kind of go in and clean it up. You could also go in and just do a pocket to clean up that floor where the flatlands is going to run. But uh, we'll leave it where it's at. So we'll go ahead and say next. Right here for posting, we have work offset. That should just match the work offset number that we have. So work offset number one. Our output rotary angle would be a four axis move, but... I'm not even going to get into that. We don't use that. So even if you got fourth axis for your machine or free Bobcad, you're not going to use the output rotary angle. And then we have a button called arc fit. And this little button is really important. And it allows us to output arcs inside the G code program. So if you don't turn this little button on, 
you're not going to have any sort of arcs in your code. And you'll see when you post it, it's going to be a lot longer than you might be expecting. Uh, so always make sure to turn that on. There is a caveat to that. There's some tool paths that don't output arcs at all anyway. Uh, they're all line by line, point, point by point based moves. And one of them would be the equidistant. So if you run an equidistant, expect the code to be exceptionally long because again, it is a point to point based tool path. And so it's just, you know, no, no matter what you do, you're not gonna get arcs in that one. All right, we'll go ahead and say next. Right here, we have our Z-level rough. I'm gonna use a half inch tool, um, but it's not gonna be a radius cutter. I'm not gonna use a ball mill on my rougher. So I'm gonna zero this out, or you can go with like a bullnose end mill. Um, right here, you can see the tool material. And again, this is a fresh install of, well, Rhino and the plugin, Bobcam plugin. So I haven't changed any of my tools yet. So this is reading as high speed steel. So if I look over at my feeds and speeds here, the surface footage per minute while running high speed steel is 508. And so it's doing all the calculations based off of that. Now in real life, would I be using high speed steel? Probably not. I'd probably be going with carbide, in which case those feeds and speeds are going to change. They're gonna have a different, it's a 1300 surface feet per minute cut instead of the 508. So just pay attention to it. You know, if you, if you use the feeds and speeds that come out of Bobcam, great. If not, and you, and you wanna get more efficient or you wanna see some, some different options, uh, I strongly recommend go to the website is cnccookbook.com. He's the guy, uh, that's the guy that makes the G Wizard program and download it. It is a killer program and it does more than just calculate feeds and speeds. It's got a lot of drilling information, threading information. I've used it quite a few times to make pipe threads and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, check it out. And uh, if you guys have any any questions on G Wizard, you can actually talk to the guy that makes it. His name's uh, Bob. Bob makes CNC cookbook uh, or runs CNC cookbook. So you can actually talk to him or uh, there's a lot of videos and stuff online for how to use it. It's it's really not too difficult to use after you've done it a couple times. It's It's a lot more simple to use. All right, so tool numbering, I tell everyone, don't worry about tool numbers right now. Worry about tool numbers later on in the when you kind of finish the job, because at the end of the job, we can go back, verify our tool assignment, which is essentially looking at all the tools that we have loaded into the job, not in the, not in the tool crib, but actual tools being used. Because with the tool crib, I can go in and save a tool crib that has you know, 50 tools in it. But on this job, I'm only going to use, well, really a half inch flat and uh, probably a half inch ball. But we'll find out it's really going to be dependent on what size these little radiuses are. That's going to tell me what's the smallest I'm going to run. Uh, for now, we're just going to stick with some half inch tools. Just keep using half inch. All right. So we got our tool numbering. Don't worry about that. Like I said, we'll look at that at the end. We got our spindle direction, clockwise or counterclockwise. And then we have our coolant type as flood, mist, air, or oil. After we go next, well, if you are if you have anything else, uh, we don't have anything else to add to this. Yeah, we're not going to put a holder on it. All right, next. So right here for the patterns, this is a roughing tool path. Uh, but essentially think of your roughing tool paths as just a bunch of two axis tool paths. They're just smart enough to change their size at whatever level they're cutting at at that point. So just like with two axis pocketing, we get a choice of doing a pocket in. So starting from the outside and working our way in or doing a pocket out. I'm going to go ahead and choose the pocket out. So we're going to start from the inside and work our way out. And then our cut direction, we could just tell it climb or conventional. I'm going to use the climb. So next again. Right here for the parameters, we tell it our depth of cut and our step over. Now, just as a just to pretend here, I'm fine with this tool taking a quarter of an inch per pass. All right. Depth of cut, quarter inch is fine. So we'll say quarter inch. And we'll say our step over is, we'll say 200. So I don't go a full 50%. Now, what this is going to do, especially on this end right here, is it's going to leave these quarter inch by 200 steps on the part. And again, I'm okay with it doing that. I think the tool is more than capable of making that cut. 
What I don't like about it is how big those steps are going to be. And then I got to bring in a finish tool with it. So I'm going to bring in a ball mill and I want to use my ball mill really for just finishing the whole thing. So I'm, I'm going to prep for it. I'll show you guys how we can do that. But I'm going to start by going and just dividing this by two, not 52, two. So we'll do a eighth inch cut at a 200,000 step over. And again, I'll show you guys why I'm doing this and, and kind of how we can end up with the same result doing other things. Right here, we have our allowance XYZ. In the Pro Tool Pass, an XYZ full allowance is called a global allowance. And that's all that the standard tool paths have. They only have a global allowance. And what that means is if I leave material on this, my allowance, every surface of the model is going to get that added material to it. So 15 thousandths is left. That's what I'm going to finish with my finishing tool. All right. So yeah, I'm, I'm fine with 15 thousandths. And then right here's our machining tolerance. Honestly, I don't change this. Just leave it where it's at. Uh, most computers these days are not, uh, you know, they, they calculate reasonably quickly. It all depends on the tool path, how big of a part you're doing. And, and a lot of it really depends on your step overs and stuff. Because if your step over is set to, you know, half a thou, then it's going to be a lot, it's going to take a lot longer to calculate that because there's so much of it as opposed to like right here, we're not going anything too outrageous with our depth of cut and our step over. So tolerance, like I said, though, you really don't need to change it. I leave it right where it's at and, and just, yeah, don't even mess with it. Ignore holes and cut holes. This option doesn't really work. It all depends on if the holes are defined and how they're defined. And uh, it works well in our standalone system because it knows where the where, which ones are holes depending on how you made it. Um, but in this case, we'll we'll say cut hole, we'll say ignore holes. I don't think the tool can fit in those holes, so it shouldn't try and drill them. But if it does, we'll fix it. All right, right down here, we have our top of feature or top of job and our bottom of job. I do want to pick my bottom of job because this tool path does see how much stock we have. And I gave it an extra quarter of an inch. And that's, I'll say we're holding on to you know, 200 thousandths of it or an eighth inch of it, whatever. I don't want this to go further than the bottom of the part. So I'm just going to pick this edge right here and hit OK. And now it knows from the top of part to that edge is minus 1.5. And it's minus because it's going from the origin right here down. All right. Perfect. So that'll work. And we'll probably end up giving this a little bit more, you know, go to one point minus 1.6 or 1.75, something like that. So it could go a bit deeper. But we're just going to hit next for now. By the way, if you guys have any questions, feel free to throw those into the questions box and I can make sure to explain anything if there's anything you guys need. All right. So for the leads, how do we get into that material? Do we plunge, which is just going to be a plunge? And, and with that plunge, we could choose to do a peck or a fast peck as well. Do we ramp? So we just kind of zigzag back and forth and down. Or do we do a spiral? And with the ramp or the spiral, you're pretty much... You're just saying what the radius is of the spiral, the angle, and then tolerance. The ramp is just going to be the maximum length. So what's the furthest? So if I leave this at three inches and I use it, it's going to slowly, you know, at a three degree angle, move across a distance of three inches and then go back and forth. I usually tighten it up kind of like how this one looks. I usually give it something smaller. So I'd say my maximum length would be, you know, let's say five eighths of an inch. And then the angle of approach is, that nah, just depends. Now the ramp direction, that is, you know, do we ramp in this way or do we ramp in this way? And how do we determine that? Well, you got to think of a circle, all right? If you always think of a circle, then the direction becomes real simple. Let's look at this guy right here, this arc, you know, for that pocket right there. This three o'clock position, which aligns with our x-axis, would be our zero degree position. We start our arc from that position right up here. So we'll call this th we'll call this three o'clock. Right here at twelve o'clock, we're at minus or not minus. We're at ninety. Right here at nine o'clock, we'd be at one eighty. Right here at six o'clock, we're at two seventy, and then back to three o'clock is three sixty. So when I say my ramp direction has zero for the angle, 
we are going to ramp in the direction of that zero degree three o'clock position. So I should expect to see my ramp going, uh, we'll say parallel to the X axis. If I was to change my ramp direction to 90, now I'm gonna be parallel to the Y axis. So really the biggest thing here is make sure you set up the right direction, especially if you're trying to squeeze a tool into a certain area, make sure you have that ramp direction to match the angle of that area. Because you could do 45s, you can do whatever number you want really. I'm gonna go with zero there and I'll leave it on ramp. We'll go ahead and ramp our way in and we'll say next. Now the options page for the three axis standard tool paths, kind of dumb. They don't really give us much more power. Unlike what we'll see on the next tool path, the options page is big. For the cutting extents that we see right here, I don't mess with this. If I have a certain area I want to machine, I make a boundary and I make it, I, I do it that way. I'm not going to tell the system to go machine just the inside stuff or the outside stuff. It never seems to do it as, as I would expect it to. And how does it really know what's inside versus outside other than, you know, kind of the picture. Again, a boundary is the best way to control where a tool path goes and where it cuts. So I don't really mess with that. Uh, down below that, we have our processing. Now, processing is either by area or by level, meaning I can go and finish an area before moving on to another, or I can take the floors down evenly. So I can take off a quarter inch here, take off a quarter inch here take off a quarter inch, another quarter inch here, and take off another quarter inch here. Or this one is, you know, quarter inch, quarter inch, and then we're done, move to the next one. So I'll leave it on that. Next again, we have our advanced feeds. Now the only thing in the advanced feeds for these standard tool paths is gonna be a convert rapid to feed. You might also have some linking options, but the convert rapid to feed, what it does is it takes all the G00 zeros out of your code, and replaces them with GO1 feed moves. And it's to help with an issue called dog leg rapiding that some machines run into. Um, so yeah, I don't need it for anything right now. And we're just gonna hit next. So right here, we're gonna go ahead and use, which is what's the length of the tool we made? Two inches, good. So right here is another roughing pass because we're just gonna look at both of them. We did the standard, now we're doing the pro version. So I'm just gonna go up to my tool crib and I'm gonna pick my half inch flat right there and hit okay. There we have it. Next, all right, now the advanced rough is a lot smarter than the Z-level rough. So we still have our, our same options that the Z-level gave us, which is the offset out and the offset in, which is you know pocket from the outside in or the inside out. And then we also have morph spiral. What this does is it converts any shape, any cut into a spiral toolpath. So we don't have linking moves. We don't have to worry about, uh, these are bad pictures uh, with all this. We don't have to worry about these linking moves right here. The morph spiral is gonna kind of turn everything into a spiral. We also have parallel, so that one's good. I use this one for long, usually open-ended shapes so the tool can go in and off, you know, on and off the part as needed and you set up the lace angle now same with uh, the ramp that we looked at before in the leads of the z level rough this aligns with that circle so if i was to use parallel and leave it on 90 i would expect my tool path to be going along the y parallel to the y zero would be parallel to the x and then we also have adaptive roughing or high speed machining and essentially with these roughing passes i said it before but they're they're essentially just two axis tool paths that can change their size. So doing a high speed machining strategy or an adaptive roughing, totally doable. I'm gonna go ahead and just use the offset out though, start from the inside, work my way out. And we can look at other options if anyone's interested, but we'll start there. Right here, we're gonna keep our method as a zig. I like using zig because it keeps everything moving in one direction. I can tell it to climb or conventionally mill. If you turn off, zig and you go to zigzag you lose that climb versus conventional selection because you're now doing both next we then get to our parameters so the depth of cut i've said earlier i'm fine with this tool path taking a quarter of an inch and uh so that's what i'm going to do this time now to make it you know i don't want you guys to think i'm pulling one over on you because why did i go smaller on the other one why did i go with that eighth inch here 
Well, with this advanced rough, I also have this option right here called number of intermediate steps. And the number of intermediate steps allows me to go back and where I would normally be left with these quarter inch heavy uh, steps on the part, I can tell it right here to go and cut those again to make them smaller. So I'm going to tell it to just cut one extra. So we'll just go any of the big steps that'll go in and cut them. Now, we also have an option here that says detect stock thicker than. And so what I can do with that is say, if there's any stock that's thicker than, I will say, 30 thousandths, all right, go in and cut it. But if it's under that 30 thousandths, or if I'm machined close to where my allowance is, I shouldn't have a lot of extra cuts. So this will actually shorten the tool path or shorten the code a little bit because I'm leaving out, instead of doing the whole part with this thing, it's just gonna recognize the areas that need it and it's gonna go in and cut it, all right? Right here, we have our tolerance. Once again, I'm not gonna change that. We have ignore holes and cut holes. We have our depth options. Now, I'm gonna just be honest. The way that I use this is pretty much, if I'm not using min max from both, I'm using a user defined job. So I'm going to say user defined my bottom of job. I already took the measurement. So it's minus 1.5. I want it to stop when it gets there. Again, we may go a little deeper, but there it is. The allowance in the old tool path was here. It's over here. Now we have a global allowance, which is that X, Y, Z allowance. Every surface is getting the same amount left on it. And then the other option with this one is a side and bottom allowance which is not a bad idea because, you know, I'm using a flat tool right now. Why not go in and finish the floors if I could? We're not going to do that. That's why we have a flatlands tool path. So we're just going to leave it on global for now. Go next. All right, the leads, how do we get into the material? With this one, we have a plunge or we have a ramp. But when you choose ramp, you have a bunch of different ramping options. So you do still have spiral. You still have that zigzag normal one but you could also do a profile. So basically take the overall shape of the part and offset it inward. We also have a line, so you could just work on a line, all right? Uh, automatic is gonna choose one of those four options. And I like using automatic because if I have an area on my part where I'm gonna be plunging, you know, pretend there was a second one of these mirrored the other way. So I have two pockets with a wall in the middle, depending on how, you know, the shape of the pocket and, and all that, um, we're either with automatic, we could say, let's do a zigzag for entering here, but we'll do a spiral to enter in somewhere else. All right. All right. So I'm just going to do a ramp. I'm going to say, let's just do automatic. I don't care. Ramp length. What did I make the length before on this one? Five eighths. All right. Good. So whoops, right here. So we'll say five eighths as well. All right. And we'll go next. Right here for the options. Now, like I said earlier, the standard tool pass options page is pretty kind of dumb. It doesn't really do much for us. A lot of times there's some settings on it, but nothing, no, no game changing settings for us. Where the pro tool paths, this options page is a lot, lot better. The first thing we're going to see in here is rest roughing. And rest roughing is used primarily, you're not going to use this ever for the first cut of your tool path, the first cut on your part. The rest roughing is used to say we go in and rough this whole part with a one inch tool. Now I'm using a half inch tool. Well, I would have my advanced rough that goes in and does it with the one inch tool. And then in here, now that I'm using my half inch tool, it would read that information. And I'd be able to go in here and say, I've already cut this thing with a one inch tool. I say I, I left 15 thousandths for the allowance, just like I'm doing now. There was no corner radius. It's all, you know, kind of there. After I have this done, so after I have my, my rest roughing, if I was to hit compute, it's only going to give me tool path where that previous one inch tool couldn't fit. So I'm only going to get tool path in the areas that this half inch tool can now fit where that one inch couldn't. So a lot of the big open pockets that we have, you know, the big, big opening in that pocket, the one inch tool would machine that but it can't get into these corners. It's going to leave big old half inch radiuses on here. So that's a way to get your tools to kind of work together without them really working together. But again, you'd never do it on your first advanced rough. You'd always use an advanced rough and then a second advanced rough. 
Right here we have our machine flatlands and machine flatlands is a button we can click and I'm going to click it because it allows us to machine the flat floors, go in and machine the flat floors. I'm still going to leave my allowance on it, but I do want to make sure that it gets hit. And I like this option because let's say from here down to the floor is, what did we set our depth of cut to a quarter inch? So say that's, that's a one inch depth. I mean, it's not really, it's probably a half inch. Should take me two passes to get to that depth. And it naturally is going to end at that depth. But let's say this is three eighths. So we're going a total of a half inch plus three eighths, so 0.875. Well, I told my depth of cut to go at a quarter of an inch. So it'd go a quarter, half to three quarter. And then in a lot of these tool paths, especially the standard tool paths, that final eighth of an inch would just get ignored. Because it's not part, it's it's below what our depth of cut was set to. So if that happens, and it's dangerous when that does, because I might be expecting for my finished tool to only encounter fifteen thousandths, maybe a little more, but definitely not expecting it to encounter another eighth of an inch worth of material. So yeah, right there we have our flat lands. I'm going to turn it on. One second, I got to get a drink. All right, now the boundary options. Now, I didn't set up a boundary uh, because I didn't think I'd need one right now. But if I did set up a boundary, one of the biggest issues you run into with boundaries is making them the wrong size. You go and make your boundary, and it's supposed to be a little bigger, or it's supposed to be a little bit smaller. And so instead of going in and making a change to the boundary itself, to the wireframe or however you did it, uh, in these pro tool paths, I can tell it to use the center of the tool on the boundary, which is how all of the standard tool paths work. I can also tell it to go ahead and offset to the inside. So bring it to the inside, keep it inside that geometry, or we can let it go outside that geometry. So, so be on the inside or the outside. Right here, we have our smoothing. Oh, I'm going to leave it on center tool. I don't have a boundary, so this doesn't really matter. Right down here, we have some smoothing options for just smoothing the just the transitions between areas and corners. So we're going to smooth our corners, kind of round them out a little bit. Still going to cut everything properly. We're not adding radiuses to the parts. Just going to smooth how it cuts those corners. Same with the linking moves. It's going to smooth out those links. And if you're being real aggressive and you're doing, say, uh, you know, really this only happens to me when I go above about 75%. Uh, but if I was to go 75% for my step over, Sometimes it'll leave little pegs in the corners where it's moving around. So this remove corner pegs option allows me to just remove, sorry, remove any of those corner pegs that might come out. So it, it's actually going to cut over and then do a little loop and then continue on. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit OK. And then right here we have our processing by area or by level. So we have by area or by level, just like with that three axis standard we looked at earlier. And then your intermediate steps. So these, this page here links back to this number of intermediate steps. And it's when are we gonna perform these intermediate steps? Do we do the cutting and then at the end of it, do all of our intermediate steps? Or do we do a cut, do our intermediate step cut, do a cut, intermediate step cut, and so on? All right. Move keyboard. All right. So now we go back down to our options. So I'm going to tell it to do those intermediate steps after the last depth step. So as it finishes the majority of the cutting, it's going to go back and recut the steps. All right. Next, we have our links. How do we connect from one pass to the next? We can go direct. We can make a little S link or we could do a retract. I'm going to go ahead and do a S link. And then if there's groups, I can either go direct from one group to another, I could do an S link, or I could do a retract. So once again, I'll go ahead and hit next. Can you guys hear me all right? Is the mic, or... yeah, there we go, that seems better. All right, so right here we now have our, oh, next. Right here we have our gouge check. So gouge checking is essentially being able to go in and pick surfaces 
that we can tell the toolpath to stay away from. The problem is, I don't know if I'm going to have any of those surfaces. As of right now, I don't know what this toolpath's really going to look like. So I'm not going to set up any gouge check, and I'm never going to really set up a gouge check the first time I go through a part because I don't know if I need it. A lot of times, instead of using gouge check, I'd be using something like a, um, what you call it, a uh, my boundary. I would fake, I, I would fix my boundary to make the gouge not happen if I was getting some gouge. All right. So this isn't the first thing you should look at if you are getting a gouge. It's you know, go look at what you have for your boundary. You go look at your geometry, see if there's any issues with it. And if none of that can fix it, then yeah, you'll go in and check that button on and say, I am gouge checking. And then right here, you could either do your feature geometry, or you can actually do check surfaces and check surfaces. It allows you to open up the window back here and actually pick the surfaces that you'd want to avoid. Right here for the allowance is basically how much you want to avoid it by. So we're not going to run that. Just go next. For the advanced feeds, we got our convert rapids to feed. So again, that's that G01, G00 conversion. Uh, well, G00 to G01s. Uh, right here, we then have our linking feed rate. So our feed rate to be used with links. And then right here, we have our adaptive feed rates. And you actually get more options here depending on what pattern you choose. If I choose the adaptive roughing, I actually have volume-based or radial chip thinning for my feeds and speeds. Uh, I'm going to go with the offset out. And we'll go ahead and hit next. So those are the two rough passes. Now we're on to the finish pass, and I am going to use some ball mills for this one. So it already set it up. The only thing I need to pay attention to is do we have the length on it? It's protruding out of the holder 1.75. Our part is 1.5. So yeah, it's close, but uh, that should be fine. So next. Uh, the patterns here, we just have our climb versus conventional. That's it. Right here, we have our parameters, so our depth of cut. And I'm not going to go crazy, but I'll set this to, say, 50 thou. This will give us a good idea of what it's all going to look like, but it's not going to take too long to calculate. And you know, The finish might not be the best, but it should be decent enough. Right here, we have our allowance, so zero. We're at a finish point right now. We're trying to finish this uh, toolpath, and we're trying to finish it right on that surface. A positive value is going to leave material. Zero is going to finish right to the size it's drawn, and a negative uh, allowance will actually go into the part a little bit more. Again, there's our tolerance. I'm going to say cut the holes. I don't care. And then again, we'll set our bottom of job at minus one point. Whoops. I accidentally hit enter there. One point five. And we'll probably, especially with this one being a ball mill, we'll probably have to go a bit deeper on this one because we need to get to the bottom edge of the part right there, but we also need the ball to go past it. You know, we need it to go through. So we'll, we'll see, we'll try it for now. We'll go next. Right here, we have our leads. So I'm gonna plunge, I'm gonna ramp, or I'm gonna spiral. Uh, at this point, all I really have is the, you know, about 15 thousandths worth of material. So I'm just gonna plunge with a single depth. And on any of these finishing paths, when we choose our leads as a plunge, we then get lead ins and lead outs down at the bottom, just like a two axis tool path. So we have vertical, we have a parallel, a right angle, or a circular. I'm just gonna go with vertical. Next again, we have our options. So I have my innermost, outermost. Again, these are those, this is a standard tool path, so it's really dumb with the options page. Uh, real simple, I'll say. Right here, we have our processing again by area or by level. And then we have another option for calculating from the tool tip or the tool center. So yeah, not worry about that. Next, right here for the links, we can either follow, we could do a horizontal then vertical step. We can do a spiral, a retract, or we can do an S-link. I'm gonna go ahead and say follow. My linking on boundary is what do we do if we run into the boundary? Do we follow it back to the beginning of the cut or do we retract and wrap it? And the deciding factor for me, if I'm gonna run into a boundary is how long does it take to go back to the, you know, if I do a follow, if this distance is only a couple inches, yeah, that's fine. Just follow it back. But if the distance is, you know, 18 inches, yeah, I'll probably rapid that. So I don't have to waste my time because during this move out here, we are going at whatever our cutting feed rate is. So 
next. Right here, we have our advanced feeds. And again, just the convert rapids to feeds. And, and then you have some lead in and lead out feed rate percentages. So these are percentages of our cutting feed rate to be used when leading in and leading out specifically. Next, again, we have our advanced Z-level finish. Same tool. So we'll use that ball mill. Right here for, for the patterns, we could do it from the top down or from the bottom up. If you think of the patterns on the Z-level finish we had before, all we had was climber conventional. So already it's a pretty big step up. So I'm going to say, let's go from the top down. Right here for the method, we can zig, we can zigzag, or we can spiral. Now, I usually run with a zig just because it keeps the tool moving in one direction. Um, and spiral is a good option, but it all depends on the geometry. Spiral is not going to be a good option for a part like this, just not a good way of real fin really finishing it. Uh, we do still have the climber conventional mill, so I'll leave it there, then go next. Right here for the parameters, we have our depth of cut. Again, I'll just say 50 thousandths, nothing crazy. And this does have some extra options now. So prior to this, if I leave this on, you know, go from the top, do a zig, climb mill. That's essentially what the Z-level finish is already doing. The Z-level finish is, you know, we're essentially running the same tool path right now. These options right here help us kind of fix that. So the first one is called machine flatlands. Now, the Z-level finish does not like cutting floors. It likes cutting walls. And it even has an option right there called machine vertical walls. And if I machine wall just the vertical walls, then the tool path is very happy. But it doesn't doesn't like cutting floors. So machine flatlands, what it does is it gives you one pass at the floor level so that you can blend your floor into that corner a lot easier. All right, so one pass floor level makes it easier to blend with. And then we have the machine vertical walls only, and we also have an adaptive depth of cut. Normal tool path right here is going to have larger steps in the area where there's an angle or, you know, from going from vertical to an angle is going to be a big difference. The adaptive depth of cut allows me to go in and say, I'm going 50 thou for my normal depth of cut. That's what I want to use most of the time. But in the areas that need it, go ahead and go down to 20 thou. And I usually set my maximum step over to the same as my depth of cut. And that's just as far as it can go before it lays down another tool path. All right. Top and bottom of job. Again, we'll do our bottom of job, say minus 1.5. We'll see what it looks like first. Uh, allowance, just going to leave it at zero. And I'm not trimming anything to, the, to any stock or anything. So next. Leads. We got the plunge ramp spiral. I'm going to do that. Uh, plunge with a vertical lead, just like the, the Z-level finish we ran. The options, we have our boundary options, just like with the advanced rough. We have our cutting extents. Now, this one has three options. Extents lets the center of the tool go to the extents of the part. So basically to the edge of the stock, the boundary, whatever is in control there. Part bottom allows the tool to drop off the, you know, from the top down. And the last one is called 3D Extents. 3D Extents allows us to extend beyond our the edge of our part. So with the Extents, you can actually see it right here in the picture. The tool that's on the right, this guy, is going to leave this little ski jump worth of material right there. And the 3D Extents will not. The 3D Extents is going to allow it to go past it so the edge of the ball can clean up that edge. So... Pretty much for me, if this is an option, if this is available in the tool path, I'm pretty much going to turn it on. For the rest finishing, now rest roughing, I talked about using that one inch tool, then coming back with a half inch and having the half inch just cut where that previous tool couldn't fit. You can do that for finishing as well. So you'd use multiple of these advanced Z-level finish uh, tool paths and then kind of work your tools down from there. Processing by area or by level, calculate from the tool tip or tool center. And then we do have angle ranges. And this is a super handy function, especially if you're using like a planer along with it, because a planer is planer is kind of the cleanup crew for everything else. So if you're using a planer, you can say you go and cut, you know, between zero and 30, like it shows here. And this Z level will cut the walls, the steeper areas. We also have the ability to use this tool path for undercuts. 
So if you have a tool that has the ability to cut an undercut, so a lollipop cutter, a dove mill, tea cutters, you can actually use those with this tool path. And what's nice is you don't have to you don't have to draw anything. Right now, if I'm using like a T cutter, the only tool path I really use is a two axis profile so I can tell it exactly what to cut. But we're just gonna go next. Right here for the links, gonna say follow, but we have direct, horizontal, vertical, spiral, S-link, or full retract. Again, this is a pro tool path, so we do have gouge checking. And then finally, the advanced feeds. All right, last tool path here is the flatlands, and it's a pretty easy one. I'm going to start by going up to the tool crib and picking the flat end mill. For the parameters, or sorry, the patterns, it's essentially a advanced rough, but just a pass for the floors. So I have my offset, I have my spiral, and I have my adaptive roughing. I'm going to go ahead and just say offset, and just going to kind of offset in, offset out, just offset. Uh, we're going to zig so everything moves in one direction. And we'll climb mill. Right here we have our parameters. So the step over. This is for flat areas only, and I'm using a half inch tool. So I'll just do the same little step over I've been doing, just 200. Uh, actually, let's go. A lot of this should be. Uh, no, we actually really haven't cleaned up the floor other than our initial roughing. So yeah, I'll do point two. That's fine. The minimum width of flatlets. What's the smallest flat area that the system is going to recognize and go and cut? 50 thou. We also have a maximum with the flatlands uh, and it's defaulted to five inches, but no one really uses that too much. I've used it a couple times when I'm doing a big part and there's a big area of flat. You know, right now I'm using a, a half inch tool. I don't want to go clean out a whole big area with a half inch tool when I could just swap tools to something bigger and get a, you know, a cleaner cut uh, or, a, or a bigger, larger area of cut every pass. So we're not going to turn that on right now. Tolerance, half a thou. Bottom of job, shouldn't really matter, but I'm going to leave it off on this one. The allowance is set to zero, so we're not saving anything. The leads, we got the plunge, the ramp, and the spiral with a vertical, parallel, right angle, or circular lead. I'll just go vertical, that's fine. Options, no real crazy options on this one. You have your boundary options here and your smoothing options. Same smoothing options we had inside the advanced rough when we looked at it. You can calculate from the tool tip or the tool center. And finally, the links. So we can follow, we can go direct, we can make, make a little S link, or we can do a retract. And gouge check. Again, this is a pro tool path, so there's gouge checking. And then right here's our advanced feed rates. Again, we're not going to make any changes there. So when we're all done with this, we kind of set everything up. And, and at this point, we've set all of our tool paths up. If I hit compute, it's going to compute all these tool paths. The problem is I just spent a long time making all those tool paths. And if I was to hit compute and something was to happen and may, um, so Rhino's been very stable for me so far, so I'm not anticipating it. But if I was to hit compute and the, uh, the software crashed, I lost all this work, everything we did. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say finish instead of compute. I'm going to say finish and then go up and say file, save as. And I'm just going to throw it right on my desktop. So we'll say save. And now I have it saved. So at least from this point, well, did I even, what did I save it as? Oh yeah, the three axis mill, perfect. So now at least if something goes wrong, I'm saved up until at least this point, which is great. I might be, you know, and, and I save often from here on out. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and compute these. So just going to right click on that feature three axis there and say compute all toolpath. And it'll take a second, uh, but it shouldn't be too outrageous. We didn't go that crazy with our step overs, but with 50 thou for our finish, that's not too bad, so. Just so y'all know, 
the calculations when they're when you're calculating toolpaths, the part of your computer that's doing all that work is your processor. Uh, just so you know, it's uh, it's doing all the thinking for you. So the better processor you have, the faster everything's going to calculate. I recently, just last last week, yeah, uh, put a new hard drive in this computer, and it's been running like a dream. All my stuff's running faster than it's ever run until I have to go calculate a toolpath because I didn't I didn't change my processor, so I'm running off a fairly old processor still. Um, but there it is. All right, so now that we have the toolpath on the screen, now I'm going to go up and say File, Save, so that it saves all that information, and I don't... You know, again, if if something happened to the software and it crashed, I can reload it and I don't have to sit through the calculations again. Uh, Frank said, you mentioned equidistant outputs arcs. Equidistant never outputs arcs. Um, <laughs> it doesn't output arcs. It's So the, the whole cool thing with equidistant is the reason equidistant works. And here, let me just do one right quick. Let me blank this out. I'm just going to slap a quick equidistant on here. And so geometry, there it is. Hit OK. And I'm just going to pick my strategy as the equidistant. And I'll set this. So even if I turn on arc fit, this is the option you're looking for, Frank. It's the arc fit button. But it, again, doesn't affect the equidistant, unfortunately. Kind of. It's, it's, it's how the toolpath is made. So the whole thing with the equidistant is that the step over stays consistent, excuse me, no matter what surface you're going over. Um, I'm just going to leave all these defaults. So I'll give it my 50,000 step over. And uh, bottom of job, we'll set the bottom of job on minus 1.5. And finish. And then we'll go ahead and save. Okay, save. And then give it a compute. This one will take a little bit longer to calculate, but it shouldn't be too outrageous. So again, the equidistant keeps a consistent equal distance step over. So it leaves you a really nice finish a lot of times. But again, it's point to point. And you can actually see it when you zoom in real tight on these areas. Uh, uh, I, I'm zooming past it. You can see it. There's a line. There's a line. There's a line. So I turned on, if I edit this, I turned on my posting arc fit option here. And if I post the code right there for that toolpath, so this is just the equidistant here, uh, it's all line moves, the entire thing. You might get a couple little, uh, a lot of times you will get, uh, like this one right here, has some arc moves. Those are usually going to be leads um, in there. Or if it's a perfectly flat arc, like this one right here might actually have some little arcs in it. But for the most part, it's going to be, it's gonna be um, line moves. You can also go in and you can see the difference. Well, let's see. Hold on. Let's go posting here. Let's see. We got for this entire equidistant here with the arcs on, we're at uh, nine, four, four, six from percent sign to percent sign. Let's go see if we, we have a change. If we edit this and we might actually have a change because the uh, they, they've been working on this one for a long time. Now that arc fit button, another little thing to mention for you. If you forget to turn it on originally, which I've done many a times before, like that three axis that we did where we got all five of those tool paths. Um, if I forgot to turn it on, I can turn it on. And it's literally just like a toggle button. You don't have to recompute afterwards. All right. You just hit finish. That's just like a, a button that says in the code when we when we produce the code, do we create it with um arc moves or not? It's you don't need to recompute. The tool path has the arc moves in it. It's the the post that'll kind of finish it. So let me go ahead and post that again. So we were at like 9446. So they definitely made some changes. You'll see there is pure arc moves now. Even in these, you know, these flat ones could have arcs technically. Uh, but now you'll see, yeah, we added a lot more code. So they did do some changes. I don't know exactly what they updated. Probably just optimizing some things. So yes, make sure you turn that button on even for equidistant now. Uh, because it, it shortened us by almost... 5,000 lines worth of code. That's a big, that's a big savings. Yeah, about 5,000 lines of code or so. So yeah, definitely turn it on. And again, it's just simple option. If you forget to turn it on, you can turn it on whenever you want. 
Uh, a lot of times I notice it when I post my code. And I'm like, where's all the arcs? Click that button. Again, you don't have to compute, just say finish. All right. So I'm going to turn that one off for now. And let's go ahead and look at these tool paths we made earlier. So here's our first Z level rough. Whoops. Right there. So there's our Z level rough. Nothing too crazy about it. Just a roughing tool path. The roughing tool paths are hard to really see what's happening anyway. Here's our advanced rough. All right. Bit more rapid moves. Uh, I don't know what lead it decided to use way out here, but that's what it set it to. So I'd, I'd probably come in and force this to use certain leads. Uh, right here, we have our Z level finish. So the Z level finish is going to just kind of work its way down and clean up those walls and pretty much every wall you could see. Uh, we then have our advanced Z level finish, very similar to the Z level finish. The difference is going to be, you can see it right here. We're adding a little bit more path to that to kind of clean it up. That's that adaptive part. You can actually see it all over the place. And then finally we get to the flatlands. So the flatlands is going to just machine any of the flat areas. All right, so let's look at, I'm gonna turn off the advanced rough and the advanced Z level finish. And I'll turn off the, the flatlands for now too. And so what we'll see is just the Z level rough and the Z level finish and kind of see how much it gets done. So to load the simulation, you can go either right here, there's a little button to simulate or there's a big couple buttons right up here on the Bobcam tab. So I'm gonna launch the simulation and we'll see. Man, I got nervous, this is the first time I've loaded this. All right, so for this being the first time I've loaded up the simulation here in this, uh, on my new hard drive essentially, I'm going to go and change this NC mode to length mode. That's the first thing I'm going to do. This gets me truer views of the machine, uh, of the tool moving. And then this is that machine I was talking about. I have the Simulation Pro, so I can actually see the full machine. I'm going to switch this to workpiece stock. This is going to lock the part in place so the tool can move around and make the cuts. The other thing I'm going to do is right here under Toolpath Rendering, I'm going to tell it I want just the current operation to show. And I want just a segment of it every time. I don't want to see all the toolpath all the time. And I don't want to have to turn off the toolpath every time I come in here. So by doing those settings, again, current op here on that first column, second one in, and segment right there. It'll just show us a segment. And as it finishes the segment, it'll disappear and show another piece of the segment. All right. So we'll go ahead and say, let's leave it right in the middle there. We'll say run. And we'll see it start to rough its way in. There it is. So again, this is the Z level rough. And we did a offset out, I believe. I think that's what we picked for that one. Offset out. Yeah. Right there. Now it's focusing on that one side. It doesn't really go down the sides of the part because of the, that um, cutting extents option. So you'll see we do leave a bit of meat on the outside there that now our finish tool has to encounter and deal with. So we'll just keep going. Let's see what it runs. And right down here, we're about to finish. You can see right when it gets that line, we're going to switch to our ball mill. And this one's primarily just going to kind of follow the geometry down and around. I hope it doesn't go in that hole in the middle because it's going to... Uh, it's going to encounter a lot of material. So right there, we got a big one. All right, now... This is telling me that there was a collision and there was a collision. We didn't, we didn't core out that big pocket on the inside there. So it's saying, Hey, your tool just hit something that we weren't expecting to be there. Um, really it's, it's kind of knows that it should only be machining on that wall. And when it sees anything, you know, hits anything, but that stuff on the wall, you're going to get this. Now it is the tool flutes. It's the part of the tool that should be cutting, but it's, that's just going to be way too aggressive. So we have to fix that Z level rough if we decide to use it. Would I like to continue? Yes, I would. And so this is going to finish out here. Goes along the outside. And uh, yeah, we definitely need to switch maybe a three eighths or a quarter inch end mill for finishing. Uh, that'll do it. But there we have it. All right. So how do we get the tool path, the Z level rough to go inside that area? 
Well, let's go right here. We can edit this feature. And I believe, let's find out. I told it to ignore the holes. So I'm going to tell it to cut the holes. All right, that's it. Finish. Now, I did not change the rough, the or sorry, the advanced rough, the Z-level finish, or the advanced Z-level finish. And because I didn't change them, I don't need to recompute those ones. I only have to recompute this Z-level rough. So I'm going to right-click here and just say Compute Toolpath. Just let it recalculate. This one shouldn't take too long. And then we'll relaunch the simulation. Now, I'm not going to sit through the whole thing this time. Uh, I'm just going to fast forward through it. And I'm going to fast forward using the move list that's over here on the left. So right here, you'll see there's two operations. I'm going to click on op two here. And what we're going to see is everything that the Z-level rough should have done. And we got some sort of bad lead on there. So, so we'd have to pick our ramp. Oh, we're ramping into there. My ramp is set to that 5 ace level. So again, final change. And then I'm done with this Z-level rough for now. We're going to edit this feature. I would change my ramp on there on the leads page, either a spiral or a plunge, you know, just whatever I can get away with. So finish, compute. And yeah, it's one of those ramps that's right over there that's colliding with it. So hopefully this will be a little bit better for that area. Hopefully won't gouge. But that's the change we'd make. All right, now we're done with those ones. Those are the simple ones. All right, now what I could do is I'm going to turn on the advanced rough, the advanced Z-level finish, and the uh, flatlands. So between this one, uh, we are going into that pocket, it looks like. And if we want to verify, we can flip the part upside down. Yep, looks like we're going through there. Uh, we're doing the outside. You can see we are actually taking the whole outside, unlike we were with the Z-level. And uh, yeah, and then we have our Z-level finish, which this one's essentially the same thing. Uh, did I turn off? Let me edit this guy real quick. Just go to my parameters. I told it to cut the holes. Huh. Why are we not going into that pocket all the way? I'll have to look at that, but that's fine. And then finally, we have that, that flatland. So let's go ahead and simulate these ones. And once again, all right, so we'll say run on this. Don't want to run too fast. Uh, one benefit of the advanced rough is that it always tries to kind of start off the part, especially if you don't give it a boundary. Um, you know, boundary locks it in, but it doesn't, uh, it'll kind of tell it not to. The boundary can also tell it where to kind of start. So here we go. There's that one. And what we'll see is we're leaving these steps here, these big, you know, these steps. That's what I was talking about. The finish tool has to encounter these steps. But when we finish our final pass here, we're going to go back and recut all those steps. So right there, around, and now we work our way up and we go in and remachine those steps. Now, I turned on an option that told it to recognize if there's any um area around it that it needs to clean up that it will and then we're going to come with our ball mill and start the finish process not super happy with the fact that that center hole is not getting finished with the z level but right there and it is a zig so it's moving all the way around it looks like a zigzag when i run it so fast but we're just going to pause this and what i'm going to do is over here on my move list there's a long toolpath there's a lot going on i'm just going to click on op three right here and what that'll do is it'll fast forward to the point that op three starts. And so that's what our finish is going to look like so far with that Z level, uh, the advanced Z level. And then we can come in. I'll turn this down a little bit. Say run. The flatlands is going to start by cleaning up the flat areas there, which I really don't need that pass. It's, you know, I, I, I would have faced this block or something. And then we're going to go in and start that flatlands on the inside. And there we go. A little offset there. Now the holes, 
it, the Z level tried to cut them. A bit of that's because of the fact that it's a ball mill, so it's kind of infinitely small at the bottom. Uh, it'll almost always drop into those. What you can do to avoid that is add little surfaces. Just put little surface covers over the tops of those holes and pick those covers along with the geometry when you pick your initial geometry. So when you pick the whole model, you'd pick those little covers as well. Um, but there it is. So other than the fact that we're, we're not using the right tool, we need to definitely si go down in size with the tool. Um, it looks pretty good. So we're going to close this. And I'm just going to pull up my little cheat sheet once again. So step number four was where we started adding the tool paths. And step number five is do step four until you get the part done. Step number six is check the machining order. Now, because of the fact that we're using uh, the same tools between, say, all these cuts. So if I turn all this stuff on, if I right click on milling job, I can go right here to my machining order. And in the machining order, you'll see it's currently running the way that we have our cam tree set up, except for this equidistant right here. So we're doing tool one for the roughs, and then we switch to tool two, but you'll see it group tool two, that equidistant thrown in there as well. If I say individual tool and hit OK, it's going to group it together like we see it. If I say individual feature and hit OK, it's going to go in the exact order I have my cam tree in. So that's just something to think about. It's going to go in the order you put your cam tree in. That's it with the equidistant. So again, their individual feature goes the way you put your cam tree. Expect a lot of tool changes with that one, where individual tool is going to try and keep the, the one tool running as long as it can before swapping back, all right? So you check that out, make sure it's set up the way you want it to run. Number seven is verify tool assignment. Now, verifying the tool assignment is checking the tools. And we're gonna do that by right-clicking right here on my milling tools. We're gonna go down to verify tool assignment. We only have two tools in here, um, but you could have a tool crib uh, uh, loaded up that has 50 tools in it. These are the only two tools that are actually being used on this job. So you can't go based off exactly what the tool crib's telling you. You want to go off what the assigned tools is. This is also the point that if you wanted to change your tool numbers, you can uncheck use automatic tool numbering, and you can double click on these numbers to make the change and set them to whatever you want. Another reason this is huge and why we, why we use this is I've made many jobs where I'll have my you know, say my half inch flat end mill there and the stick out on it is two inches. So I'll use that tool to cut my first set of pockets. You know, maybe they're an inch deep and they're within, within the range. But if I go and pick a pocket that's two and a half inches deep, you know, it's longer than, or it's deeper than the stick out of my tool. We will actually create a tool that is long enough to fit that a lot of times. So you'll end up with a tool that's a bit longer and it doesn't swap out so you could have duplicate tools in here and again this is where you can go to see those duplicates and say okay i accidentally put you know i i need a longer tool i want to use that long tool for everything and so you'll see it in here and again uncheck that you can change your tool numbers and it does retroactively go back in and change all the tool numbers in the job and let's go back to our cheat sheet so we checked the assigned tools we simulated the program i like the way it looked uh, so we're good there. If you find any problems, go back and edit the parameters in the cam wizard like we did <coughs> with our Z-level rough, Z-level finish stuff. Nine, we post the code. All right. So the most important thing when it comes to posting is that when you expand the machine right here, you have the correct post processor, the one for your machine. If you don't have it shown up right there, you can right click on this post that's here currently say edit, and then right here hit select. And this will take you to your posts folder and you can pick whatever post you want. That BC 3X mill is just a generic three axis machine. So a lot of times, as long as you have the right um, post processor, you're gonna get the right cuts. Even if that BC 3X mill or whatever machine you're using is, I mean, it should be right, but yeah. So just make sure you got the right post processor. After you got that verified, you're gonna post the code. Now, I did it a few minutes ago. If you want to post just a single tool path, you can go to, say, this Flatlands here. I can right-click on it, and I could say Post. And it is going to post just the Flatlands, none of the rest of it. If I want to post, say, just the standard tool paths, 
I'd use this post yes, no option here. So the post yes, no, it's this little, looks like a little controller. I'm going to click that at the machine setup level. And that's going to turn everything off. All right. And then right here, I'll post just the Z level rough and the Z level finish. Now to post both of those, I can right click on milling job here and just say post. Or up here, we have a option for posting. And so you just click it. And it's going to post the code. So now we have our Z level rough. And then somewhere throughout here, after it finishes all of this, I might have missed it. I don't know. We'll have our Z level finish in there. I don't know. Nope. Just kidding. That was a big arc move. Yeah. So it's in here somewhere. I'm just not going to go search for it. I'd have to open it in an editor and look for a tool change. But yeah, there it is. Now, if we want to do all of it, we would just do our post yes, no, leave that thing off, you know, leave them all off and then post the code. And this is going to be the entire job, including the equidistant down at the bottom. So we have you know, 18,000 lines of code. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. And then the final step of the entire job is to generate a setup sheet. Whoops, didn't mean to load the simulation. How'd that do that? Hmm. All right. All right, so I'm just going to close this. All right, so the final step as part of that little cheat sheet is generating the setup sheets. And you do this by right-clicking on the milling job and saying generate setup sheet. The setup sheet I use is always the full setup sheet, so I don't really change it, and I'm going to hit OK. And we're just going to wait, and it'll load up inside your default browser, and you'll see the name, the date and time, the total cutting distance, feed or uh, rapid distance, number of ops, number of tools, number of setups, total cycle time with the feeds and speeds that you use. If you change your feeds and speeds, this will update. Uh, I took a screenshot of our part, so we know which part it is. Uh, kind of nice materials listed there stock size listed there tools right there with their stick outs and everything and then you got all your tool paths and you'll see a breakdown of each one of those uh, cycle times and then to save this the way i usually save it is i actually do a print um, if you're using uh, uh, what is it edge or explorer whatever they call it nowadays uh, you usually could could right click and there's a print option in there. For me, I don't have a print option in this um, in this browser. I'm using Mozilla Firefox, uh, and I think Google Chrome does the same thing. All you have to do is hit Control and P on the keyboard. So Control and P like print, and you can print out the page. Uh, what I really like to do is Microsoft print to PDF for my printer. So instead of actually sending it to a printer, I say print to the PDF and it's going to save a copy of this file as a PDF for me. So if I need it, I can post or I can, uh, you know, print it out at a later time, which I couldn't print right now anyway, because I forgot to set up my printers again. So I have to get my IT guy to do that for me. Um, and then, but yeah, the Microsoft print to PDF just saves it as a PDF. So I can come back and look at it later on uh, if I need it again. And I'm not wasting my paper because I might need to make some changes on this thing. All right. And that's it. That is through the um, right there. We finished the guide. That's our kind of cheat sheet guide. We went through all 10 steps. And by the 10th step here, we have the setup sheet. We have the code. We have the part tool path, you know, everything. Make sure you save. That's it. Now, just make sure to do a file save. There you go. And always make sure to save a copy of your, your work that you're doing. I've, I've met a lot of guys that they'll go in, they'll program something, and then for some reason they don't save the part. And it's just crazy to me. Save the part so it's done. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Any questions, anything I could answer for you guys while I'm here? Uh, if you have anything, feel free to put it in the questions box. Otherwise, I'm done for today. Uh, we ended a little early, but not a big deal. Um, so, yeah, thanks, guys.